So welcome back to our second video on abstract models. This is sort of abstract models part two, um, where today we're looking at models that use double indices and summation signs. And we just went over, if you watched the previous video, how to formulate our orange juice problem as an abstract model. Um, so these next few videos cover coding that into PLL. Uh, so our video goals uh, for this particular video are to look at formulating the sets, parameters, and data file, and then also formulating the decision variables. So let's get coding. In particular, let's start with the sets, parameters, and the data file. So if we look at our OJ abstract model, uh, this first part of the video is covering these first lines of this abstract model, the declaration of the sets and the declaration of the parameters, and how to put that information efficiently into the data file. So I've given you sort of a place to start. So if you go to my courses, you should find ojabstract.py and ojdata.dat. So you're going to want to grab both those files, save them into the same folder on your computer, and then when you open them into uh, Spider, you should see something like this if you have a split screen. So taking a closer look at this code, we're just going to quickly go over what it's doing because you've seen all of this before. Uh, so these first few lines should be very familiar to us. These are importing libraries so we can use them in our code. Um, so the first line is importing our typical PMO um, functions such as constraint, bar, param, and then the second import statement is grabbing solver status and termination condition so we can make sure that our problem or our model is running correctly when we go to run it. Our next line is creating our abstract model object for us. So everything that we add to our model from now on is going to be added um, to an object called model. And in particular, we're making an abstract model. So an abstract model is going to be looking for a data file. Next up, we have two lines that are making our sets. Uh, so here we see we're making a quality set and a product set. And both of these sets are being added to our model. If we look over in the data file, we can see the elements of those sets. So we see that qualities has the elements six and nine, and then products has the products juice and bags listed. And so I think this is the first time we've seen words used as elements of sets. Uh, but you can certainly use words as elements of sets. And again, when we're making sets, we're using colon equals instead of an equal sign, and we're ending the list with a semicolon. Next up, we have our first parameter. It's called profit. In our original formulation, which we see um, down in this part of the screen, it said profit sub j is equal to the profit of product j for all j that are elements of products. Because we see uh, this for all j that are elements of products, that informs us that we need to pass model.products to our parameter function. And what this is going to do is it tells Piomo I need to make a profit parameter for every single one of my products. And then when we look over into our data file for our profit parameter information, we can see that we're using both juice and bags, which were in our product set, we're using them when we're defining that parameter profit. And again, we're using a colon equals, and we're ending our profit parameter with a semicolon. Next up, we have our available parameter, and our model formulation um, read as follows. It said available sub i is equal to the total amount of quality i available for all i that are elements of quality. So because we have a parameter for every quality, we're passing our quality set to the param function. And this tells Piomo make an available parameter for every single one of our qualities. And then over in our data file, we see that that available parameter declaration is using our different qualities from our qualities set. And again, we're using colon equals, and we're ending that available 
parameter with a semicolon. And then finally, we see the required quality parameter, um, where this one we're passing it the um, set of products because we have a required quality for each one of our products. So if we look more closely at our data file now, we see that we have a parameter profit that uses the product set juice and bags. And we also see that we have a parameter required quality that also uses the set juice and bags. So it also uses the product set. So we could actually save time typing if we had defined the profit and the required quality at the same time. So we can actually make this data file a little bit more efficiently. Um, and if we did that, it would look like um, what you see on the screen here in circled in red. Uh, so let's look more closely at how to define more than one parameter at the same time, as long as those parameters use the same set. All right, so starting off, we have the word param, um, and it's immediately followed by a colon. And then after the colon, we have a space delimited list of names of our parameters. So here we're um, specifying the profit parameter and the required quality parameter. And then once we've listed all the parameters we want to tell PML about, um, we follow that list with uh, colon equals. And then each one of our rows is going to be one of our products because both of these sets are defined over the products set. Sorry, both of these parameters are defined over the product set. So we see juice on one row and bags on the next row. And for juice, we've provided the profit for juice and the required quality. And same for bags, we've provided the profit and the required quality. And the number of spaces you leave here between one parameter value and the next, it doesn't matter. As long as you leave at least one space, you almost got to know that the next number it sees is for the next parameter. And then finally, we end that whole set of parameter, parameter declarations with a semicolon. So in your file that you turn in, you should um, create this more efficient data file. And then up next, we have the code for our decision variables. So in our abstract model, we see our decision variables here, where they say x i sub j is equal to the pounds of orange quality i used in product j, for all i that are elements of qualities, and j that are elements of products. Um, so here, probably really small and fuzzy on your screen, is all of the code that we need for the model part of this formulation we'll see the code to run the model um, in some further videos. But this is all the code that we need for this entire formulation. Um, and here we're going to look more closely at this decision variable declaration. Uh, so in this decision variable declaration, uh, we see that in our description we have two subscripts. So when we're making our decision variable, we have to provide it which sets are being used for each of those subscripts. So the very first sort of argument that we've included in our var function is the model.qualities set. And we basically said by putting it first that the first subscript in our decision variable is going to be an element of the quality set. And then Following immediately after the quality set, we see the product set. Um, so the product set is going to be used for the second subscript in our decision variable. So the order that your sets appear in, it tells you the order of your subscripts. So because we've listed qualities first, we're always going to expect qualities as the first subscript in our decision variable and products will be the second subscript in our decision variable. So for example, if we were to make an instance of our model for the very original orange juice model that had um, quality six and quality nine and juice and bags products, the following four decision variables would be made where we see a quality is the first subscript 
and a product is the second subscript. And one thing to note is that our different sets that we're using are separated by a comma. Here, our decision variable uses two sets. Um, some decision variables may use three or four sets, and we just keep separating them by commas. And then finally, once you're done listing all the sets that your decision variable needs, each one will become its own subscript. Uh, then you list the non-negativity constraints if you have any. So ours, in this case, are non-negative fields. So that makes up our decision variables. Next up, the video will cover making our objective function and sets of constraints.